Um, my father had owned investment properties since I was a, like about six months old. And uh, he, he fixed all his houses up, uh, mostly by himself. So I knew that was a strat strategies that would work. Um, and I also knew that I could call on him if, if I had questions about managing properties or how to fix them up. Uh, it really helps to have a mentor and somebody you can count on to help out when you don't know what you're doing because it's, it's a big learning curve to do real estate. Um, I was fortunate to have a full-time job throughout my investing time. I had large revert, uh, cash reserves when I needed them and access to capital for investments when I needed them. I think those are very important things to have. It'd be really hard to make a go and be successful if you're investing on a shoestring. Um, I chose to buy rentals in Portland and manage them, sell, manage them myself in order to have greater control or gr and greater returns. But managing rentals isn't for the faint of heart. I was fortunate enough to buy the right properties or be bailed out by a rising market or having large cash reserves. Portland was a great time to, was a great time to buy when I was buying. Portland was a great place to buy when I was buying. Um, where I invested and why. Turns out, or, or, or what I would, done, would have done differently. What have I have done differently? It turns out that I had, that had I had more uh, investing experience when I bought that first house in 2006, and particularly with the mind of an investor, which I didn't have at the time, I could have gotten it for a lot less money. And uh, yeah, it was overpriced, but I was anxious to move to Portland from where I was living way out in Forest Grove. So I was willing to pay a little bit more and I had the cash reserves from a successful uh, previous home owning gigs. Um, I did a lot better on the three bedroom house because I had more experience and uh, even better when I bought this one bedroom house that I live in now. And that's basically about all I was gonna say. Cool. What was the interest rate uh, on that property you bought in 06? It was uh, 4.4. 4. Okay. And did you buy all the houses first to live in so you were able to use owner-occupied financing? Yes. Okay. And, and it also helped that I was living there while I was doing um, my own updates and repairs. So I didn't have to get uh, building permits. Yeah, and so you, I do you know, at my own pace. And so you did all the work yourself? Yes. Well, nearly all of it. I had a foundation put under the, the first house that I bought in 2006. And of course, I didn't do that myself. But I, tore, cool. out a I tore out a chimney. I replaced the carpet floors with laminate and uh, a whole bunch of other things. Cool. Well, that's awesome you were able to retire at 52 when you know setting the goal in your in your 20s to retire by 50 um are you going to buy any more investments or are you just set what are you I thinking think i think i'm set and i may even uh use my exit option on that house i bought in 2006 because this is the one that's vacant in a few days um, oh, okay if it doesn't work out or i don't like how the New Portland rental rules are, I could just sell it and I'll be fine. Got it. Has anyone else run, run up against difficulties with uh, the recent changes to Portland rental laws? Uh, in what regard? Well, the screening is much more stringent and even the move out process is more stringent. Yeah, I, I haven't personally. Um, we're in Milwaukee by about 100 yards, so I'm happy with about that. Uh, although I know Milwaukee tends to shadow Portland or follow closely behind. Um, what I've done, because I work with a lot of multifamily people uh, and I know quite a few property managers, I'll just pay them for their time and be like, hey, what's your hourly rate to make sure that I stay legal, or you can pay a lawyer to make sure you do it correctly too. I go to a lot of continuing education classes 
on the new updated laws and they, and I'll go to different people who present them, different attorneys, and they all give slightly different answers. So, um, no, I mean, that didn't answer your question at all. I understand that, <laughs> but, um, it's the water is still murky on it. Um, but I haven't run into anything personally. I just ask other, other property managers what they're doing and, and ways to navigate the new, all the new laws. Okay. Mark, you want to uh, tell us a little about what you got going on in Ohio? So I, um, I bought my first house in 93. I had to, um, I started food guys in 91. So I had to wait two years for self-employment. So I bought it in September and like the month after I officially had two years and the market was pretty cheap back then. I actually was afraid to pull the trigger for many, many years. And then, uh, I bought my, I bought a fourplex in 98 in, uh, Irvington, eighth and Hancock for, uh, 450,000. It was already kind of done. Um, we looked at the one next door. I didn't have any parking. And so this one was done nicer. And so my agent called them and we worked the deal off market. And then I ended up selling that and exchanging it for 39 units in Oregon and Albany. And so, and then uh, I bought, I have a mall in Newburgh. I'm having kind of the same experience with commercial where the Chinese restaurant wants to renegotiate in there pretending like they don't know what the cam charges are. And it's like, it's water. You guys use like thousand dollars a month of water. You know, it used to be like $2,000 a month. And then we started making them pay their water and found some issues and stuff. But, and then in uh, 2009 um, is when I went to Ohio. I had a guy that worked for me. He was my onsite manager for my Albany property. And he grew up in Ohio. And I heard things were cheap in the Midwest. And so it looked like I could buy things for half off for the same math that I was getting in Albany. And so I bought 50 units there. And then, um, and then in 2010, I bought another 20 with the uh, listing agent that had listed the 50 units. And I bought that on an owner contract. And then I just kind of kept growing. And then when I ran into property management challenges, I'd stop hire someone else and think I solved the issue and then I'd start growing and then they would suck as well. And then I'd, I'd hire someone else. So that's been my biggest challenge um, is property management. And right now we're doing it ourselves. We have our own team back there. So we have about 10 to 15 people between maintenance and leasing agents and property um, admin. And then we have contractors doing it. So, um, I've tried a little bit, you know, I flipped some houses back in 06 and 08 and then I stopped. It was, it was, felt like gambling and it was too stressful and I don't like to be stressed. So I, I just did like eight and then I was like, I'm done. It's not any fun. And then, uh, the market was starting to go down and the broker I had it, he was like, no, no houses were selling. And I'm like, well, that's not true. There are houses selling. They're just not selling like hotcakes. You're going to have to make sure that my house is one of the ones that sells, you know, and uh, I've done a lot of 1031 exchanges where I take um, equity and tax defer it to other properties. And so I really like that. Um, so we're doing cost segregation where it's a way where you hire an engineer and they um, put your property in like three buckets, four buckets between land, zero to five, I think it's like five to 15 and then above that. And so then anything below 15, you can write off in the year you buy it. So if you buy something for a big dollar amount, you can, uh, you know, accelerate the depreciation. You don't have to wait, whatever it is, 30 years to get your depreciation. And so my, my secret or whatever is I do a lot of reading mindset. Um, part of where I, when I started doing a lot, I wanted to meet, um, I was at some meetups back in the late nineties and someone introduced me to rich dad, poor dad. And then they told me that Robert and Kim Kiyosaki were going to speak 
at a conference in Houston. And so then I went there and then I got introduced to a lot of the infomercial type people. I bought their books and tapes. They, uh, they gave me the formula and I'm kind of a math guy. And so I just followed their formula. And uh, it worked pretty well other than the, I, I wasn't really good at saying no. So the guy I was hiring, he's, in, he's more of a handyman contractor person. And I didn't say no, like, oh, let's put this. <clears throat> it was kind of like Fixer Upper where you, you put a steel beams in the basement because you want to have open concepts. So, of course, I'm, I'm paying for that. And we moved some stairways. And so my jobs were like, should have been uh, 35000 They were coming in at seventy. But the, but the market, you know, I bought them for Cortland houses. So my goal was to buy everything 80th and 50th probably more like 50th and closer to downtown on the, I guess it'd be on the east side. And uh, so that was kind of my market I was focusing on and we're buying stuff for I think 70 grand, 80 grand. And then we would, my goal is put in 35 and it'd be worth 140 and I would create that equity. So part of why I got into investing is I felt like I'd spent all my money other than my, uh, profit sharing plan for your kind of like your 401k and then at the end of the year you just felt like and then I'm like well I'm only in my 20s it's gonna be like 30 years before I get to touch this money and and it seemed like buying a house creating you know the equivalent of 35,000 30,000 dollar equity was a lot easier than trying to uh, save all your money um, from taxes and stuff so and my goal was to plan to gain cash flow would be to buy 10 houses, create 30,000 each of equity and trade them for apartment complex. It's kind of like the game where you would, you would buy small deals, create equity and trade that equity for cash flow. And so uh, it's kind of worked pretty, pretty well. I mean, I've been able to accumulate a lot over the years and I like to try new things. That's why I ended up getting involved because I thought it'd be kind of cool and something to learn and stuff. And so, uh, I've had a warehouse. I have some storage units. Um, I've done lease options. I flipped, flipped 10 houses. Um, tried to do the burr thing. I called it the infinite math strategy rather than they call it burr now. But for me, it was like infinite math where you would create equity, refinance it, pull out all your equity. And then the goal was to take it and put it somewhere else. And then I kind of got a little overextended in 2001. Um, where uh, had some personal stuff happen with my son and different things. And I was having trouble doing the business and that. So I kind of had to pick. And then uh, I bought a math house for fun and got it cleaned up. And we we're going to close on uh, September 11, 2001, 12. So, then, so they were like, oh, I guess we're not closing, you know. And uh, but I was like trying different things. So I've done it more for fun than true retirement because uh, I don't have any hobbies. I don't really like the garden or I'm not a carpenter. I like watching sports and traveling and playing basketball and in certain routines. But to me, it's more of the game, you know, I like, I like to play Monopoly as a kid. And uh, my first love was the stock market and I kind of got disillusioned in, in the in the late 80s about the whole thing with some you know so i decided to try this instead and uh, i was worried in the 90s that my business would become obsolete with the internet so i wanted to have a backup strategy just in case uh the business had difficulty so that's kind I of got my two questions and they, they don't relate to each other a whole lot if at all um one is did you prescribe to what Robert talks about when he's like, you take your, the money you make from your business and you pour that into passive income producing assets. And then the other one is what mindset book are you reading right now? Cause I'm into all those. I love those types of books. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I, I do a lot of reading. So like um, I've been a big fan of Warren Buffett. So uh, I, <clears throat> what I try to do is model my business like seeds candy. So I don't know if you know much about Seas Candy, but he bought it for uh, $30 million back in 1972. And 
that business has generated uh, $1.65 billion since uh, cash flow, and they've only needed 40 million of it to go back into business to maintain the business. And so to me, I've looked at my business as kind of a free cash flow where most businesses today take more effort than true money. They take effort and skill and commitment and energy and people. And so it doesn't, a lot of businesses are not necessarily um, require a lot of working capital. And so my goal is to take the, any excess and buy uh, properties. And then it kind of forces me to then, uh, sometimes I'm a procrastinator. And so then if I keep the, the business somewhat I won't say poor, but whatever, it forces you to deal with things a lot sooner where if you just sort of have cash. Like I've looked at buying a business and they're like, I don't have any money. I'm like, you have a million dollars in your bank account. You only made 15 grand with that money. And you're paying, a, I was going to buy a company. And it's like, you're, you're paying a million dollars of rent. You could just buy the building and you would eliminate your biggest expense. <laughs> you know, you could take that same money. And so I, I, I was going to do that, but it was too much. Uh, they didn't have the team. I didn't have the team to replace his team. Cause he's kind of like a dictator. He's kind of a scary guy. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want to learn from this guy. Cause he gets mad. I'm like, Oh shit. I have this business that I don't understand. You know, as far as mindset, um, I listen to a lot of podcasts and then, uh, I, I, I work with a lady here in Aurora where I do a lot of energy work and mindset training. Um, I just had uh, my whole company pretty much 80%. We did uh, Donald Miller, who does Story Brand. He did a uh, kind of how to create your life plan. And so this morning from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m., we, uh, we started with, you know, the end in mind, like what do you want your obituary to read and kind of what do you want your kids to say about you, right, when you're, you know, and so it kind of, and then from there you start and then go backwards, right? Like, what do you want your people to say about you? And then going, hmm, what do you got to do now that would create that kind of relationship that they would say things? And so and I listen to podcasts, Jake and Gino, some Rod Cleef a little bit, a lot of bigger pockets. Um, Brian Buffini has some good stuff. Um, I don't read as much as I used to. I used to just read like crazy and I'm kind of lazy now with podcasts. Uh, I don't, I mean, my attention span for audible books isn't very good anymore either, you know? So I prefer, uh, you know, podcasts. And then I usually visualize, can I manifest what they're saying? And I work with this lady to then be able to do those things that, that maybe I'm stuck. And so I've done a lot of I used to get depressed a lot. And so then uh, I would stop being in action and then your results tank because you're not in action. And then you're like, oh shit. And then I, you know, right before I'm ready to crash, I get going, get, get out of danger. And so I've been seeing her for like 20 years and I just go there as a regular routine as my insurance, to make sure that with everything that I'm trying to managing that I keep centered and calm and focused and then spend time with the kids and and bring joy and happiness to people in my life. So that's kind of what I do. I mean, I, I've done a lot of Landmark, and I don't know if you've heard of them, but I've done a lot of their programs over the years. Um, mainly I took that because I wanted to be like Marv, and Marv was a salesperson. I was a stockbroker for a couple of years, and Marv was like, he was playing at a different level, and I just asked him, and he said Dale Carnegie and Landmark, so I just, I just did what he said. So that's kind of been the thing. I, if someone says it's good and I kind of do it, I don't really, uh, they don't have to prove it to me much. <laughs> I just say, oh, it sounds good. If it, if it makes sense, I'm like, okay, I'm, uh, I'm in, you know? So I don't know, did that answer your two questions? Oh, uh, very well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks for sharing all that. That's, Awesome. I'm, I'm swimming in thoughts right now, to put it lightly. Um, you had two messages for, for me, Mark, before we started. I was fiddling around with the computer. Um, what I, I do these days is pretty much nothing. What I want to do, when I want to do it, 
and uh -huh. consisting of playing computer games these days. And that's uh -huh. just fine. That's a great retirement for me these days. It was kind of my goal not to have responsibilities. Yeah, I'm kind of looking at it. So for me, my, my mom had a lot of anxieties and so she kept herself busy. And I think part of my issue with retiring early is that I think I'd like to be busy as, way, as my strategy for my anxiety. And so that when I'm not doing anything, then the, some of the old narratives come, come back. And so I want to look at how I can uh, find a way where um, I have, I work with probably 10 property managers and I've only had really one solid one who just sends me checks and manages the details. And if someone moves out, I mean, it literally fills a vacancy within a few days and his turn costs are amazing where most of the people I've tried both in Oregon or whatever, they're terrible. You know, they, uh, they're really not on the game. <laughs> they, uh, their processes are broken and I'm not saying mine's better, but they're probably a D or F. I'm a, a C plus right now and I'm moving quickly to a B, a B. And, uh, I think I can be at A by the end of the year, you know? Um, but, I like playing basketball but right now. It's shut down. It's kind of disappointing. <laughs> so it sounds like you enjoy business as well. Thought of going like I do. the SBA and being like one of their mentors for people who want to come in and start businesses. I thought about it. I mean, one of my goals, I'd like to be a venture capitalist. It seems like that'd be kind of fun. So I would like to uh, get out. I'm not really doing a lot of the day to day at food guys. So someone else kind of manages that. Um, I'm more of the culture guy. But I like to um, help people uh, get their dreams, you know, and not just have money to pay bills. Because right now, part of our society is they're not very, they're not very educated, and most of the, the only reason they have money is to pay bills, and so they're not really looking beyond to create a future, you know. And I always wanted to have the adventure for me, and it takes you have to have money and time to have adventure. You also need courage, but you know, and you want someone to do it with most of the time. But you should start that company. I'd hire you. I do like that. That's fun. So I've helped people. Uh, one of the guys, the salespeople, we, uh, he manifested his truck, you know, and it was kind of funny because he got a picture of it and he just bought it last week, the oh, exact nice. same model or whatever, and had a goal to hit a certain commission structure or milestone, you know, a certain check, and then work backwards on what he had to do. And so I like seeing someone become that you know, person. So to me, that's really fun to see people uh, who maybe were a little timid go out and make things happen and have, you know, we have a few, few of the people have rentals right now and they'll come talk to me about stuff about their own rentals. So I'm getting people, helping them get over the fear of buying a house and things like that. So yeah, start the life coaching business, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of do that for the people in my life. They're open to it. <laughs> I don't know about it. I thought about writing a book and doing stuff, but I'm not a really great writer, so I, uh, I may not do that, but maybe. What does your shirt say? Uh... I don't know. It's something about taking the day off to go to the Blazers and stuff. It says, uh, I'm way too sick for work, but should be able to make it for the game. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I, I can come and go as I please. I've been able to come and go as I please for decades, you know. So for me, it's almost like retirement. If I can come and go as I please. You know, and I don't have anyone uh, too much criticizing me. When I haven't had a boss for like 29 years. And so the bosses I had, they tended to put me down or they ignored me and then they'd complain about me. So, I, you know, for me, if I don't have a boss and someone's bugging me and criticizing me, then it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter, you know. And I like having a place to go and stuff, but I don't have to be here at a certain time, you know. So I can come and kind of pretty much come and go as I want, you know, but I've been working more of this since COVID just cause 
that's that's another thing that's helped me with my mindset. So I decided with the COVID, it's you know use it as a catalyst to get my get my act together on the areas where I've been complaining, you know, to uh, draw a line in the sand and stuff. And that's kind of how I do it. I mean, technically, I bought started food guys in a recession. I didn't know it was a recession. It just seemed like. Starting the uh, business was better than going back to school. You know, starting to get the hang of it. You know, what is food, guys? Uh, we sell food ingredients to food manufacturers. So we sell uh, like we start out frozen fruits, and we sell juice concentrates, nuts, grains, olive oil, avocado oil, and we sell that to all kinds of companies all over the U.S. and Canada. So you're a distributor. Not really. A distributor, um, we're more of a direct sourcer where we ship it from where it's grown directly to the customer. Where a distributor, they usually consolidate to one location and then they, add, they ship, you know, 50 items on the truck where most of our stuff is like one or two items is what we're selling at a time. Okay. So someone will buy a truckload of frozen peas at one time. So we ship it directly. Uh, to be grown out of New Jersey, Oregon, Washington, different places, and we just do the math to see where it makes the most sense to supply them with their ingredient. And so we manage all the details, paperwork, all the food safety. So it was a lot better business than being a stockbroker. I didn't really like that business. I wasn't I wasn't prepared to deal with people's money psychology at 22, all their fears. Especially, I didn't really have the same level of fear that they did, you know, so. <clears throat> How about you, Marissa? What kind, of, what kind of stuff do you like doing? Oh, um, I'm really into hiking. Um, I'm about to launch a business that has to do with uh, hiking and sustainability, basically. Um, but I want to... I was a former chemist uh, for six years and I did not enjoy it. At the end, I got very burnt out. So for the past year, I've kind of taken some time off been renovating my house. Mm -hmm. And I work for my, my dad who owns properties. And then we're currently renovating the dental office um, to get that ready since the dentist uh, didn't really tell us he was retiring and really bad time to get another dentist in there right now. Um, but yeah, eventually I want to start investing in properties, but I have a nest egg right now and I'm going back to school and trying to get most of it paid for. I got a scholarship and um, I'm also in the running right now for some government positions that pay for your tuition. So I'm trying to start a business and I work for my, my family and I'm going to school. What's your, what's your uh, what are you gonna study? Uh, computer science. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, my passions are baking, gardening, hiking. Um, I'm busy all the time. Construction. I've got a fence going up right now. Um, I don't know if you guys can see that. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I'm not good at any of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, they. Uh, I did a project once for the school to raise money. I, I, I bought the house with my own cash, and then I'd say I'd donate the profits, and then I was kind of trying to help do the money, and then I was doing it like you frost a cake or something. Eventually, they told me uh, that you're making it worse. You need to leave. Just go. You're good at getting people to show up, so just call some people and get them to show up. But don't touch the house. Leave it alone. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. So I was just focused on getting, seeing if people would uh, show up, ask them to come show up and do something. So I uh, just not good at that, you know. Well, the problem is I, I keep getting work done. For example, I had a guy that's a known good worker come and, and set the posts because it's just, I had a shoulder surgery as a volunteer firefighter and screwed up my shoulder. So I can't lift these super heavy tall posts. And I ended up having to dig one of them out uh, today, which he put in last night. So I just can't get the work done properly. So I usually end up doing most of it myself, just a pain. Right get it done. I had my tile floor done twice because it was all uneven and I couldn't handle it. So I made the guy redo it. But 
it's just it's a real pain for me to get the work done it's it's better for me to do it myself um, yeah so i've had to learn everything pretty much i do my own flooring now i do my family's flooring and their units i just i'm a perfectionist and i i don't like it being done incorrectly and paying someone than having to redo it yeah well it helps when you I always played uh, dumb so they wouldn't ask me to do stuff and then it became a habit. So then I, I did learn a lot of stuff. It was just fine. It's easier to do themselves. And I'm like, yes. I need to learn from you. <laughs> so I just, I just call people and say, I need, can you help me? And they, people will help me. I just say, I need help. Can you help me? And they say, well, sure, I'll help you. I'm like, great. This is awesome. It's a, it's a good, good thing. I have lots of people. They like to help me. I had friends. I never really had an interview before because my friends and my parents would get me jobs. So I never really, never had the interview my whole life. I don't think I've had an interview before because people would just get me jobs. I don't know if I just look uh, pathetic and they just, they take pity on me, but I guess it works. Okay. But How is your sourcing going right now? Uh, you know, it's, it's not bad or part of it. We're pretty resourceful. And so our business is, is up. We only have about, I think 3% of our business is to restaurants through distributors, but the rest of it's, I think up. And, uh, for some reason, one of our, it's funny, we, we buy cashews from a company in uh, you know, out of Vietnam and then they ask us to help source broccoli. So we sold like, gosh, 200 containers of broccoli from the Northwest to Singapore and uh, feed, you know, and so I think a lot of times for us, uh, things will change and the supply gets disrupted. And so then uh, you have to find other sources. And then my thing is, is that in this type of economy, what happens is people will uh, wait for things to change, right? wait for things to go back to normal where my philosophy it's like let's go on the gas this is an opportunity where other people are waiting we want to be aggressive and uh you know we had a guy that that um he said he made a cold call and he, he got a po within two days you know because he he saved them like three dollars a pound they were um buying perfect cashews and then they were grinding them for their cashew butters and he's like you could buy just pieces for way cheaper and i don't know why their existing supplier had never uh recommended that they're wasting this money buying these perfect perfect you know paying for this perfection and then they just you know run it through a grinder and they're you never know they started out at these beautiful cashews so <clears throat> in our business so I have my dad wanted me to be an engineer and so I have an engineering degree but like you with chemistry I'm like yeah by the time I realized it, it was my senior year and I saved all the yucky classes <laughs> all the things that are related to physics which is like I'm totally not interested in this but by then I was tired but our sales process is like an engineering process where we, where we help them look at their ingredient purchasing business. And most of the time they're focusing on sales, hiring and production, and they don't actually look at, is there a better way? And so we ask them questions and about how they're doing it and then look at the math. And usually we can improve what they're doing, you know? And uh, there's usually, we save them enough money that, that everybody wins and uh, we can add some confidence to what we're doing. So it's kind of like probably wholesaling houses or something, you know, where you're wholesaling, but I like it. it doesn't, it's, it's fun. And I like the people, you know, they, uh, you know, in the stockbroker business way and like is that people say I need to invest and they could say that for 50 years and never take action. Where in the food business, they have to buy it because they have an order from Costco. So they, have to buy it from somebody. So there's a level of urgencies. They can't procrastinate. So they have to buy it and they're more logical. If it makes sense, they'll buy it. So, and if it doesn't, they won't. And it's just that they'll talk about it and, and 
they, uh, it's, it's pretty nice. I like it. It's a way better business. As for me, I'm attracted to business models, you know, more so than uh, I like the game. But what kind of, how do you, tell me about your business again. So it's sustainable hiking. How does that work? Um, I'm not sure yet. I'm in the very beginning stages, but I'm going to try and find basically sourcing. I'm also vegan. And so I want to kind of go into that world a little bit more and make it less because whenever I'm looking for something, I spend so much time researching. And honestly, I just want to be out hiking and kayaking and biking. So yeah, it's basically going to be that. And then eventually I'll make some products myself. But yeah, at first I just want to sell products that are already made. So you're going to sell, what kind of products are you So you're going to sell some vegan products? Yeah, and sustainable. Okay. And it's mostly for, I want to aim it at the outdoors um, for hiking, uh, kayaking, biking, those types of things. Mm -hmm. I think the cashews actually now, it wasn't for butter. I think it was, uh, we sold some cashews for that product where you, uh, they want kind of like a vegan um, yogurt or something like that. Mm. Yeah, there's four. Oh, no, that's not based on cashews. Yeah, I think uh, Forager is based on cashews. Yeah, we sell them. I used to do supply chain as well. Um, my title was senior chemist, but I managed our raw material supply chain. Uh -huh. uh, I managed our, uh, it was about 1.5 million just for one item I managed out of uh, China, basically. Uh -huh. and, yeah, I really enjoyed the supply chain aspect of it. So I think I can use that um, to work on this business and make it somewhat profitable. I have a plaque from an old coworker that says master negotiator. So we'll see we what help, We help people find co-packers and things like that. So if they have a product, we, we help them do things differently. Sometimes they, like they might have a co-packer in uh, California and then they're in Michigan and it's like, why are you shipping Californian back and it seems silly why don't you find someone closer and they just they just kind of get in the habit you know and they don't want to no one's going to tell them to like make a change from how they're doing things you know unless you tell them and, and a lot of times you think in the food business they would be more competent but a lot of times they're not really competent on food safety stuff mm. it's like they're going through the motions so you're trying to teach them how to be more cost conscious and just more aware of what they're doing, you know, not be an automatic pilot, but I think a lot of people are just time deprived. So what business are you starting, John? Um, I, uh, my wife and I are owners of a franchise called Office Evolution. So it's a co-working executive suites. Mm -hmm. um, we're opening a location out in Hillsboro. So that's, uh, that's new and exciting for us. Um, I've, uh, I got, I've been in software for the past oh, plus 20 years or so. And, um, I've always been interested, like, sounds like, like you guys in trying to, uh, get financially independent or I say retire, but I, I, I also feel like I didn't really want to retire. I'd, I'd be bored. Um, but I want to be able to do what I want to do. So I, I really enjoyed your story. You, you sound like you're where I want to be, um, so that's that's kind of what got me interested in, in the real estate too. I think we we bought our first duplex in 2016, mm -hmm. and um, well, we ended up with with a single family and a duplex. So I, I was looking at kind of fixer upper types of places, and just two of them kind of fell in my lap at the same time. So I ended up buying both, and you couldn't finance one because the people had been doing a bunch of renovating. Um, but they never really finished. They started all sorts of projects, but they had sheetrock ripped off the walls and things. So, you know, a bank wouldn't even look at it. So they had gotten themselves kind of in a bad situation. Um, and so I offered them, um, I offered them a fair price, but it was, it was certainly under market. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went in and fixed that up and, and turned that around. And I've had a, an elderly couple in there for the, the entire time and they take good care of the place. So I, I think I'm fortunate my tenant um, and it was a uh, it was a double lot 
Um, so the only thing thing was they were always pestering me about mowing the lawn next next uh, in the lot next door. So I ended up building a duplex on that. It was either sell the lot and get rid of it and not have to maintain mm -hmm. it or do something with it. So I ended up building a duplex on that. Um, so now I have three doors right there on that piece of property. Um, and then the other duplex that I bought was out in uh, Willamina. That's, if you know where that's at, that's up. And uh, it, it was a good, it was a, a good piece of property too, but the neighborhood was a little, it was a little rough. Uh, right before I sold it, one of the windows got shot out and um, it was, I figured it was a good one to let go. Oh, yeah. so, so we're going to do the, we're going to do the office suite business and, and uh, see where we go from there. How are you feeling about that? Bro? on now you know i i was it's, it's a little unnerving but i feel like we're going so we just started construction on it and, and we should be open right around the first of september and I'm, I'm optimistic that all these people that have been displaced and are working from home and, and maybe uh, some of the companies who have decided to let their employees stay away from the office but they don't have a good place to work I'm hoping that the timing is going to work out to where we can provide a service to those people. Um, so I think we'll do okay. And I, I think as long as we don't slow down, I, I like Mark's comment there about, you know, just pedal to the metal and go for it. And I mean, we're, we're committed at this point and we just have to do our, our, you know, our best to make it, to make it happen. So. Mm -hmm. So you, did you buy an existing building or just some remodeling it to make suites? Um, I, it's a lease and we do have a very specific look and feel given that it's a franchise. Um, and so we're completely gutting it and starting from, from scratch. So yeah, it'll, it'll be built out into 39 offices and then we'll have some um, conference room space and kind of a lounge area. So luckily, we're we're heavier on the office side than than one of these places like WeWork or or maybe some of the others downtown where it's completely open. I think they're having a hard time because of this distancing and all of that. Where where you know over eighty percent of of this, you'll still be able to close a door and right. So I think we're in a good spot. But it was my first adventure into commercial. Um, and I'm used to buying and selling houses where, you know, it happens within, you know, 45 days, 30 days. And we've, we've been on this for over a year. I, I walked through the building the first time over a year ago and, and we just started construction this week. So that was an eye opener. Are you having to pay rent on the space during that time? No, we, uh, you don't well in my case anyway i don't start paying rent until the build out is is um, substantially complete so that's september right about the time we'll, we'll start having people come in that that's when our rent will start yeah that's the one thing yeah commercial <clears throat> i had a vacant in my mall for like five years and then uh when the marijuana thing came, then everyone wanted to rent, rent it. <laughs> like about six or eight, even some Grammys. They're like, my grandson said, this is a good business to get to. I'm like, yeah, no, this would be the best thing for you guys. So then you have to kind of pick and choose which one you think is likely to have the uh, business, you know, skills to do it. But, uh, yeah, commercial product is different because I, when I put a restaurant in there and I was, you know, man, working with the city and all the requirements and stuff and different things. And uh, it's, I, uh, yeah, I don't really enjoy it as much because then, you know, the other part, you kind of do what you want, you know, where uh, they, they, uh, they bug you. And I think we had to go because they'll read their code and they'll read it and then they get find one thing and they stop reading and then they start reading from the beginning and then they'll find something else on the same page even though. And so I finally had to tell them, I'm like, read the whole thing. Don't read it again. Just make a list. 
do not read it for the fifth time. Just make a finite list. Do not give me like another list every time. Because every time he finds something different, you know, it's kind of like Section 8 inspectors. Every time we get a different one, they will find different stuff. And it's like, they don't have, you have to kind of train them to say, okay, these are the three things. Don't look at anything else, but that's not always how they do it. So, um, do you have experience? Sounds like you have experience with Section 8. Is that, um, I've had a lot, yeah, I have a lot of Section 8. I have, um, there's a place back there, Hope Housing, which I think, I don't know if they bring people that were on drugs and they pay part of their rent and stuff. And so, um, I can is another organization, they pay part of the rent. So Section 8 is a lot more um, difficult where some of the other agencies are somewhat easier. Mm. But, I have those people I told you about that are out in my single family home. They're, um, they're Social Security only. They don't have any housing help, but um, as a way to help them, I've been thinking about looking into that and seeing, you know, I told them that I would be willing to become a section eight or, or whatever Oregon housing authority approved home. And, right. you know, I could, I think I would, I could probably charge them the rent that I need to charge them and, and maybe give them some amenities. I get landscaping for them or, you know, mm -hmm. do, do some additional things to help them out. But, um, yeah, it's, it's a, I, I've never seen such low incomes until I got into Ohio real estate. I mean, I, I had no idea people were trying to live on $750 a month of Social Security, you know. And uh, obviously rents are a lot less back there, but you're like, my God, there's no money, you know. And uh, yeah, I don't really know what society does, but I don't, I don't know what, what, what kind of income do they make under social security? Um, I think they're somewhere between like, you know, 1500 and 2000, something mm -hmm. like that. And their rent is right around a thousand. Right. And I've, you know, it's still a business. So I have to run it like a business, but I've, I've not raised it aggressively or anything. And then I don't really want to. So that's where I was starting to think, well, maybe, maybe the Oregon, if I could, suggest that they get on the Oregon Housing Authority program, maybe I could, I wouldn't ever have to feel like I have to push them out of there and they could stay. They seem to like to be there and, and I like them there because they take really good care of the property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, but their income's not going to go up. I mean, at this point, they're, I mean, they'll get their cost of living increase, but that's, you know, that they're retired at this point. It's tough because people in that area are really priced out of Oregon. They almost are forced to have to leave the state and go to a lower cost state, you know. But I, uh, since I was so busy with food guys, a lot of times I didn't realize I had like, my mindset, like I had houses in Woodburn and I, in my mind, I'm like, no one will ever pay you know, a thousand dollars a month rent. I just had that belief. And then uh, my kid's baseball coach, she was a property manager. And then I asked her what she was getting for her houses. And she's like, oh, I'm getting 1500 a month and 1600 a month. I'm like, my God, are you kidding me? So then I had two houses I was gonna sell, but because I was having trouble, the market was moving so fast, I couldn't get them to praise for what people were willing to pay them for. And then uh, I went and fixed them up, and sure enough, I rented them for fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred dollars, and ended up getting a thousand for a year. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if your house you could get fifteen hundred dollars a month, you know. And so then it's kind of the dilemma. Like for me, when people move out, I so much had avoided that situation that I was putting up a low rent, and then you're sort of, you're just sort of paying the bills. You're not really getting ahead. You know what I mean? And so that makes it harder to run it as a true business. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a toughie. Cause I, I bet if you looked at, I don't know if it's rent a meter or one of those places that your rents might be that are what their income is. You know what I mean? And right. Yeah, no, I think you're right. The, the dupe. So the, the thing that makes me feel a little bit better about it was it was a, a stepping stone. Cause I, I got the place next mm -hmm. door, which has the duplex. And right. the duplex is sixteen hundred a side, so 
and I'm only charging them. I, I think they're at 1150 right now. So right. yes, you're right. It could be a, a lot more. But the you, duplex you know you're doing new. it, but it's kind of like your uh, goodwill gesture, right? And so yeah. you're in a position where because you bought right, you can afford to give some of the profit to them. And it's, you know, you're kind of like doing a good deed. But, but as a biz, just from a, a business standpoint, pretty tough, but I would, uh, I would help them go to, you know, get a voucher, but even then it depends. How big is your house? It's about 1100 square foot. How many bedrooms though? Three. Because then they're uh, probably not going to qualify for a three bedroom voucher. So they'll only give you a two bedroom voucher. So then you can only charge whatever they agree the two bedroom voucher price is. Mm. You know, because they would have to have kids in order to qualify for to get a three bedroom voucher or four bedroom voucher. So let's say section eight will pay this amount for two bedrooms in that area and this amount for three bedrooms, right? They're not going to pay you, they'll only pay you the two bedroom rate, which may or may not be over your 1150. You could probably ask section eight, what's their, what's your two bedroom rate, right? Because usually they do a market analysis to say what right. they want to pay and then the, they would pay a portion. So you could just call your local housing person tomorrow and just ask them what the process is for having someone who's struggling financially and see if they're willing to go get help, right? Right. I don't know. No, I hadn't thought about that. That's a good point. So yeah, I'll have to follow up. I tried calling them a month or so ago and they were, they weren't in the office. They were closed. Yeah, they're working from home but a lot of them are. I don't know if they're back, but they're starting to get out again because they were not doing uh, actual inspections. They were sort of taking, taking our word for it. So they would uh, we'd send them pictures and stuff. So they weren't out in the field where they're, uh, this week they're gonna actually be in Ohio, but they'll be out in the field um, inspecting. So they're starting to open up. I've got a question for everybody. It'd be since everyone here is investors uh, along the lines of if you have a unit that's rented a little low, like say it's rented at a thousand in Woodburn and market rent is 1500. Uh, imagining that there aren't any um, laws in place that say you can only raise rents by X amount. How do you go? What are your, what are everyone's thoughts on, how quickly do you raise that to market rent? If you've got a great tenant who's always on time and keeps it neat and clean, do you make some sort of a, an exception or is it uh, like straight by the numbers? I raise it slowly. Um, a regular increase of 1% or something like that, maybe even less. Uh, and they, they've, pretty much treated me right as a, as a result of not raising the rent a lot. Um, when I had two vacancies in 2016, um, well, both my houses were empty. I was able to raise it quite a bit up to market rent. I didn't even know what market rent was because I hadn't had a vacancy in years, but that put me in, put me in the black. It was a good thing. But normally I, I wouldn't raise it when there are people in there. I think, you, I don't think you should do that. That's not my, my style. Yeah, I try and do a regular, I mean, except for the store that I just told. I, I, I They did get a rent increase this year, but I, I, you know, do the same, a regular increase every year at a small amount. And then if you have a turnover, then that's the time to bump it up to market rate. And that's what I ended up doing with uh, one of the duplexes. Marissa, how does your family handle this? Uh, we don't really raise uh, rents. Uh, I think it's been like once in the last 20 years. Um, it's just such a wild card getting new people in there and the turnovers can be really costly. Um, yeah, it's just not something we do. And I, I did work at a commercial uh, property management company and the, the rent raises each year were pretty insane to me. And it just made people move out every year is what I saw. I'm still trying to figure it out. I don't really know. I'm not very good at that part of the business. But 
I know that uh, my Albany guy, when I was, when I did it myself, I was kind of, I never raised rents because I didn't really want to deal with it, the move outs. And I wasn't, I didn't need the income to live on. But when I turned it over to him, I mean, he, my rents went from $500 a month to $700 a month in like two years. So uh, basically got his services for free and uh, he had better accounting, better everything. So it was a sweetheart deal where my, my goal was to not deal with the 20 hour at a time when they would move out. So I was trying to avoid that. So then I tended to just, you know, you kind of die the slow death of the person who you know is not good but you don't want to deal with the huge expense of moving out. So you just sort of, but I'm probably going a little bit more aggressive now and raising rents and doing things that I have. And that's kind of the, so I have a lot of stuff where I haven't really raised rents and just gets kind of goofy. And so then you're not really playing offense. And so then what happens if you don't raise rents is then you become cheap, you know, Rather than uh, if you raise rents and you put money back in your uh, property, then it's a positive cycle or you no, know, then you're trying to, you know, you can't always afford to do things. And so then it, it, I don't know, the cycle can be tough, you know. And if you raise rents and you can afford to outsource it, or um, if you don't raise rents and you get stuck with the job yourself, that's part of I don't, I don't want to do the work. So I'd rather. Uh, you know, be better at raising the rents and things like that and being, but I kind of, you know, if they're paying well and it's going there and you start adding 15, 20 bucks a month, it just starts to add up and you have enough units and you just, it's better to probably get in the habit and get over it than not raise rents because you're in fear. I, I tend to be more in fear of raising rents or I felt like I was a bad person, you know, because even selling your house, you feel like, I always felt bad, you know, like, even if that's the right financial decision, right, you still like you're displacing a family. And even though they don't necessarily have any loyalty to you, I always felt a little loyalty to them, you know, and I'll be the guy kicking them out. But a lot of times, especially when you don't raise rents, then it makes more sense to sell sometimes, you know, with the math. But there's not a right, right rule, but Long term, I think you're better off raising rents at least something every year and getting the habit. Because then, uh, if you wait a lot, especially now when with all the rent control laws, you're almost forced to do it all the time because you can't make up five years of rent because it's seven percent or whatever it is. I mean, it would take you ten years to get to the right to the you know current market rate, depending on if you stay the lower market. You know. Yeah, those are tough. Um, you know we've. I've been advised before this tenant moved out, they were on month to month and I asked the property manager friend, well, what do you recommend? And they were pretty, they were near market rent. I, we might as well just say they were right at it, maybe a hundred dollars low. And he, and he said, give them three options. Uh, month to month is as much as you can legally raise it. Uh, a year lease is increased by 75 bucks. A two year lease is only increased by 25 bucks a month. And I mm -hmm. thought, I thought that made sense. Mm -hmm. I like the approach of giving choices, right? It, I think that always works well. Yeah. Oh yeah. If you're, if you're, you know, if your property taxes and your insurance are going up and you're raising, you know, enough to cover that, that's a good way to justify it. I mean, to yourself and, and also to the tenant, I mean, they understand that the costs go up. So as long as you're not hitting them with that 7% and it's, you know, it's, it's a, you know, look, my taxes went up half a percent and my insurance went up. So I'm going to have to raise the rent, you know, 1% or one and a half percent. That That's a little bit easier to understand. They don't like it, but yeah. And then I think the other thing too, that that's been successful for me is if, if you budget for your capital expense and you just know that you're going to spend that money to upkeep the property and you do that on a consistent basis, well, then, you know, they see that you're taking care of the property. I painted the one house this last year. And then after that is when I asked for a rent increase. So, you know, I'm taking care of the property and making it better. And, you know, it's just like going to have to raise the rent. Do you set that, is that a set amount per month, like 5% a month, depending on the 
the condition of the property and then do you just keep it in, in another like savings account? It's kind of soft. I think I have two and a half percent set aside for capital expense, which may not be enough, but that's kind of on my sp spreadsheet. And I don't have it in a separate account, but I do try and, you know, I do hold that money in an account that's, I treat that as the rental business and it's, you know, it does have its own bank account. And I try not to rob from it. Got it. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, thanks everybody for coming. I really enjoyed this uh, a whole lot. It's always a lot of fun to get chatting with like-minded people and everybody. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Marissa, I'd love, I'll probably send you a Facebook message to find out like your five or 10 favorite hikes in and around the area. Cause my wife and I are big into the outdoors. And, um, would just love yeah. to get your take on it. Yeah. It depends how tough you like them to be, but yeah, I'd, I'd be down for that. Dog mountain is a little brutal but we've done it a handful of times. You know, that one's a little overrated to be honest. It's just too busy now. I'm kind of, I've got a Doberman Pinscher and uh, my nephew is a little uh, Shih Tzu type dog. And so the two of them love hiking and just a pain to run into a lot of people. So I try and get pretty far out. Yeah, well, def well, especially now when everything opens back up and everyone hits the trails at the same time, we'll need something farther out. Yeah. Um, I had one last question. I know we're kind of running over. Um, I just saw something when I was looking at a piece of property for a USDA loan where you could put 0% down. Does anyone have experience with that? I know vaguely about what they are, that they are 0% down. And it's essentially in an area, if you, if you Google USDA loan map, it'll take you to a map and it'll show you basically where you can't use that type of loan, which is a metropolitan area. Is it, uh, does it have to be owner occupied or? Yeah. Okay. But remember, this is, this is what I, um, this is straight from the lenders I work with. There's no mortgage police. Nobody's going to knock on the door and make sure you're there. So depending on your risk tolerance, you could say, yeah, I'm going to live in it. Um, and then just say something happened and never moved in. Um, that's, but the danger of that is the bank can call the note due, but they're not going to call a note due that's performing. So there's a lot of, well, how do you, if you want to roll the dice, people do it all the time. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I don't Thank remember. You. I've had people that wanted to buy my house. I think we're going for one of those USD rural loans. And then uh, I think they can only earn so much money to, to, to qualify. So more it might be for lower income as well. On top of that, um, I can't remember, but because I think they didn't have any money and they had to, they can only earn so much in order to qualify to get the loan in the first place. And then I think in the end they didn't, couldn't use it because they made a little bit too much money. And so I had to try to get a different kind of loan. So I think there's a little bit of stuff, but you could ask, a, I work, I work with Don Carter. It's pretty good. So I think she's a direct mortgage and you could ask a, a mortgage broker about the different products. So yeah. I've been having trouble getting mortgage brokers to even answer my call these days because of the refinancing craze. <clears throat> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, was, Don's really good. I have her cell phone. You want her cell phone? That'd be great. I've got my notes out on my phone, so I'm ready for you. Uh, her cell phone's 503-351-1314. Okay. Uh, we used her probably 20 years ago and then I used her a couple of years ago. So I had this, this broker and on the day I was supposed to close to buy my house, they, uh, they told me they couldn't, uh, I was declined and I was, I was like, you, you know, because I have lots of loans and then the one US bank always had this loan every year where we're kind of this fake renewal process. And so they took the half a million dollar loan and they counted against my income and but they never really said that they had this concern so we were just thinking around doing our normal process of renewing and they didn't say we had to do it and then don got us uh in two weeks we closed with don so she literally took over on the 28th of december when we we're supposed to close and we closed like 
January 16 of that year in 2019. Mm. So she's really good and thorough and just, just kind of a pit bull gets it done. And I think she's been doing it for, God, probably 20, 25 years, you know? So, I mean, she does mostly just single family type stuff, but she does investments in our occupied. So okay. if you don't own more than 10 homes, then she can pretty much, that's kind of her sweet spot. And she can look at the different kinds of loans. Most of the, you know, the other thing too, is if you refinance your personal residence, you might be able to call it cash and then take that cash and then put 20% down on something else. So even if you don't have the uh, full 20% down on an investment property or whatever is requirement, you could refinance your personal residence, pull out that cash. And I've seen people offer stuff like a 3%, I don't know what your rate is, but it might be that even by increasing your loan balance, you might be able to take the cash and move around and stuff, you know? Yeah. I've been looking at refinancing, but if you um, take cash out, they make you do, uh, I think it's a new inspection or evaluation or something. So it starts adding appraisal. Cost. Appraisal. That's it. Yeah. yeah. A lot of times you can roll those uh, fees into the loan too. The pra yeah. appraisal price should be only four or 500 bucks. I don't know. Maybe it's 650 now. I'm not sure. I haven't done things here, but um I know a guy that does that. I can ask him what he charges. I don't know. Well, that's what he charges. I, I think I don't know if they pass it through or add a market to it. But she's real reasonable. Doesn't seem to have a lot of junk fees and things like that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll check her out. I was looking at on point, but it's just I've been having a lot of trouble getting them to respond. I know. I know some people there too. <laughs> I had their. I. I like. I like doing business with lots of people, so I. I don't know if Lynn still works there. She's at the Wilsonville branch. Uh, our kids went to school together and stuff, but uh, Chase knows how to get a hold of me. If, so if Don can't work out, just tell me what you need. I'm sure I know somebody that can help you with, okay. your, uh, with your goals and stuff. So, Mark's what you call a connected man. Yeah, I like, I like talking to people, meeting them. It's interesting to me. I used to be introverted, but I got over it. Decided that uh, <laughs> it's more fun to talk to people than be afraid to talk to people. So, anyway, uh, uh, if you guys need any help, you let me know. I can, I've tried different things, so I know a lot about what works and what doesn't work in my own personal experience. And, uh, you know, I do like out of state investing, though, because uh, things are so much cheaper than here. Which Chase knows he's from Illinois, so he knows how things are really cheap in uh, the Midwest. Who me? Did you say Chase? Yeah, but didn't you weren't you in Illinois? No, I'm I'm from North Central Washington. I thought you were, who was the one from? I thought it was someone's from Illinois. Was it Cedar? Hmm. Um, maybe it was May Cedar. Yeah, some guy offered me a nine thousand dollar house. Yeah. Supposedly they're paying five hundred dollars a month rent. It's a foreclosure because it, Wells Fargo doesn't want to deal with the tenant, so I just have to inherit the tenant. So I'm like, okay, it does need a new roof. It doesn't look super beautiful, but <laughs> but pay for just, itself quickly. It's a different math than here, where you, everything's three or four hundred thousand, and you're like, oh my God, you have to be a perfect operator to pay. So. I like the I like easier math that I don't have to work so hard. So there's stuff still, even though it's more expensive, that's unusually cheap, but it's you know, but there are a lot of deals that are, you know, thirty thousand dollars, sixty thousand dollar duplexes, fifty thousand dollar duplexes that might need a little work that if they were here, they'd be a fixer upper for you know, three hundred grand or something or more. But you get $800 a side. So that's the thing I buy, you know, a, I want to be close to 50,000, 60,000 all in. And then you're getting $700 a side for a uh, 60,000 investment. And so I've always looked at the math as much better. And it's not just Ohio, but I mean, I think 
probably Kansas City, all, all of them are much more affordable. Portland used to be like that. I mean, the rents were the rents weren't high, but the uh, the properties were, you know, when I was going to real estate group, they were talking, man, they're saying they're buying a thousand dollars a door back in the seventies. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know. <laughs> and now it's a hundred thousand a door is some crazy number. It's just I don't see how it <clears throat> now nah, it just doesn't make sense to me, you know. Super expensive. Do you fly to see them all or do you have someone over there looking? Uh, yeah, I usually rely on pictures and have people go over there and see them, but I've probably only been in less than half, 20% of my units have I been in probably. So see, I'm used to, it's like buying ingredients. I don't actually see them. You kind of rely on paperwork and pictures and appraisers and people that you trust and you get burned once in a while, but but overall, the price is so much cheaper that it makes up for the mistakes that you might make by not doing it all yourself, you know? And I don't really necessarily know what to look at anyway. You know, there's things I could probably point out. But there's other things I, I wouldn't necessarily know, you know, that there's something going on. And I've had inspectors, like I bought this office building and he didn't even know when I bought it 12 years ago that the air conditioners weren't even connected, you know? And so, and their waiver says that their only liability is they have to return the $800 inspection money. I'm like, well, what good does that do? So a lot of times when you get inspected, and their, their only risk is they have to return their fee. You still have to get it from them. So they're not any good. It didn't really help you a lot, you know? So I had to replace all the, had a, probably a bad roof and had to replace an air conditioner. So that was, he, he was a licensed commercial guy, but you know, my wife says, why don't I go over there? Well, I don't buy them so I can drive around and look at them. I mean, it doesn't matter where I'm not buying them to go drive by them, you know? I'm buying them because I like the game and the math, you know? So, and uh, if the math is cheaper, then you can afford to hire people, you know? You can then be part of your team and do things that you can't do. So, but I like it. Plus, you can go travel, write it off. So, if there's places you want to go travel, you could just buy rentals in that uh, area and then you can write off your trip to <laughs> go see them. You know? Good night, y'all. Huh? Good night, y'all. Good night. Good night. I'll probably head home too, go see my son. All right. Well, everybody, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining. And uh, um, yeah, see you in a couple of weeks. Okay. Thanks All right. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. See you guys. Bye. Bye.